Well, so glad that you came to join us here on Tuesday Night at Bible Study. I promised you a love story tonight, but before we get there, I'm going to address just a few items regarding the nature of the church and where we're at right now as a congregation. We are still in the process of protecting ourselves, protecting our senior members, and listening to the governor of Pennsylvania, who's requested that, again, uh, we limit our uh, gatherings to 25 or under in confined spaces that everyone wears a mask. And so one of the things that we've decided to do, since we are also aware that singing is one of the main contributors to the spreading of the COVID-19, we, we have decided as a congregation not to worship as a congregation. We're concerned that, again, our senior members, we need to care for them. We need to protect them. So what we are doing is we have opened the doors for Holy Communion, however. We have broken our fast. In fact, both on Sunday and today, we've celebrated with quite a few of you who've taken the opportunity to come down to the congregation at your convenience with your family members and come to the altar, and we celebrated Holy Communion together. Uh, I had a lot of senior members who felt very comfortable with this. They said, look, I wouldn't be coming if it were a worship service but I feel very comfortable with the format that we're doing right now. We do request that if you do come for Holy Communion, that you must enter into the sanctuary with a mask. You may only remove your mask when you partake of the elements, but otherwise we are here for you, both on Sunday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. and also on Tuesdays from 6 o'clock to 7 p.m. Those are the times during the month of July that we will be celebrating Holy Communion. We hope that you will come down. I was just so glad to see so many of you came over these last few days, and it just really was a delight. It's been so long since we've had the opportunity, the privilege to pray with one another, pray for one another, and to celebrate together. But let's uh, prepare our hearts for our worship story. For those who watch the Sunday service, you know I promised you a love story today, and I'm going to deliver on that. So let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your many blessings, for this love story that we're going to start reading today, for Rebecca and Isaac, who serve as an example and inspiration uh, for us as humanity, the hopefulness that we have amidst the brokenness of the world. We give you thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I am excited to tell you a love story. In the Bible, we are told about Rebecca and Isaac, which is truly a love story for all generations. So let me just share a little bit about this wonderful story about Rebecca and Isaac. First of all, we are told in the beginning of chapter uh, 24 of the book of Genesis that um, Abraham, the father of the nation, was nearing the end of his life. He wanted to make sure that his son, ooh, oh, by the way, his son was probably 40 years of age at this point. He was getting up there. Still no prospect for him to be married. And so Abraham wanted his son, before Abraham died, Abraham wanted to make sure that his son had the opportunity to marry somebody, could fall in love, and uh, God would continue to bless the world through uh, Abraham and his ancestors. So he wants an appropriate, an appropriate spouse for his son Isaac. He doesn't want his son to marry out of the Canaanites. See, the Canaanites in Genesis represent everything that's evil and bad. Now, the truth is, Jews were actually Canaanites. So, it's really that theory of, you know, the tribe. The Canaanites were the larger racial group of which the Jews were a part of that larger racial group called the Canaanites. However, there is also a very specific political and uh, an ethnic group called the Jews and within the Canaanites, and also the Canaanites themselves that represented a particular politics and so forth. So the word Canaanite, um, not in generic, not big terms, but in, in terms of, well, I guess it would be generic in terms of smaller terms, but in terms of, uh, uh, it became representative of the people who opposed God. And so you notice in the Old Testament, everything Canaanite is evil and wicked. So, at any rate, he didn't want, Abraham didn't want his son to marry out of the Canaanites. That would have been bad. So, he wants an appropriate spouse for his son Isaac. Now, the amazing thing about this is Abraham is finally trusting God. What he does is he takes a servant. He says, why don't you go to Mesopotamia, my home country, and see if out of my family you may find somebody appropriate for my son to marry. And if God provides, God provides. If God doesn't, well, well. It's in God's care. 
And so when the servant left, he took 10 camels with him. One servant, 10 camels. It was, it was a test, you see. He went with these 10 camels to Mesopotamia. And there at the well, he was met by a woman named Rebecca, a young girl. And here's the amazing thing about Rebecca, as we're going to hear in just a minute, she cared for the camels. And she takes the time to care for the servant that Abraham sent, sent and take this servant into her home where he is cared for and he gets the opportunity to meet Laban, Rebecca's brother. Now, the servant there makes a proposal and it becomes this fairy tale story reminiscent of the Princess Bride. That's what I think of when I think of the story of Isaac and, and Rebecca. It's a love story, epic love story, just like the Princess Bride. And it just is a beautiful little story. It becomes the model of true love in the Bible. And so let's take a look at this. We don't, we don't get to read the whole love story because the Bible spends such a great length of time developing the story about Isaac and Rebecca and the love that they had for one another. So I'm just going to share portions of this. So the servant, remember as I told you, went to the home of Laban. Rebecca took her there. Uh, Laban and, and Rebecca and... Uh, Bethuel, which is her mother, and he's, he, he was at the dinner and was going to be fed. He said, hey, before we get down to eating, I have a piece of business I have to address with you. And so this is what the servant says to Laban and to Bethuel. I'm Abraham's servant, he says. The Lord has greatly blessed my master so that he has become rich and has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and servants and maids and camels and donkeys. Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son in her old age, and he has given him all that he has. My master may be square, saying, You shall not take a wife for your son from the Canaanites, but you shall go to my father's house, to my relatives, and take a wife for my son. So I said to my master, Suppose a woman doesn't follow me. He said, Then the Lord, before whom I have walked, will send his angels with you to make your journey successful. Again, what did I tell you? Abraham is finally trusting God to provide. The, the, Abraham's life up to this has been one tussle, one wrestling match after another with God. We finally, in the lesson we preached the other Sunday, or the last week, I, I should say, when we took a look at the sacrifice of Isaac, Abraham finally is trusting God to provide. He said, the Lord, before I walked and who sent his angels, will make your journey successful. You you will take a wife for my son out of the relatives of my father's house, and they will be free of this oath. So the servant continued. He said, I came today to the spring and said, Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you will take my journey on which I go successful, behold, I'm standing by the spring, and may be that the maid who comes to draw water, to whom I say, please drink this water from your jar. And she will say to me, you will drink, and I'll draw off your camels also. So let her be the woman who the Lord God has appointed for master servant. Now this is kind of a heavy burden to expect. This man, I, I, I know we kind of miss this, but you have to understand he's got 10 camels. How much water does a camel drink? They haven't been drinking for a long time. They made this very lengthy journey. Of course, camels can go quite a while without water. But when they do drink, they drink an awful lot. I don't know. I didn't look up how much. Maybe some of you can... Uh, Put that on her Facebook page and tell me how much a camel drinks when they do drink and how often they drink. But my imagination is this is an awful lot of water. And that's a big expectation to put on a young girl who's got to get water for her family and for her flocks. And she's going to now make sure that these animals have enough to drink. Strangers. They're animals. It's heavy burden. But it also expresses how kind a person Rebecca is. It also expresses trust that this servant has that God will provide. So not only does Abraham trust in God, but that trust now is passed on to his servant. He says, I trust God's going to do it. Before he finished, look at this, verse 45. Before I'd even finished speaking what was in my heart, behold, Rebekah came out with a jar on her shoulder. She went down to the dew spring and drew. And I said to her, please let me drink. She quickly lowered a jar from her shoulder and said, drink. And I'll also water your camels. She didn't even have to be asked. That's amazing. So I drank and she watered the camels also. And that's when I said, whose daughter are you? She said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. 
And so I put the ring on her nose and bracelets on her wrists, and I bowed low and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who guided me in the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. So now, if you're going, deal kindly with me, truly with my master, and tell me. And if not, let me know. Then I turn to the right or to the left. So he says, I think you're the right person. If not, tell me, that's fine. God will obviously still provide, but in testing the waters. I love the immediacy of God's fulfillment. Remember when Abraham was promising we have a son. How many years did it take before that promise came to fulfillment? The lack of trust that Abraham had. God was just kind of breaking him down and bringing him to that point of trust. Finally, God provided. Now Abraham's just like, whatever. And now because Abraham is trusting God, God fulfills his promise immediately. Again, I, the contrast and how long it took to fulfill the initial promise. It's just amazing. Notice also, there's another note I want to point out what we just read. This woman, Rebecca, as I said to you, she didn't even have to be asked about providing for the animals. This demonstrates the kindness, the hospitality of this woman. She is truly a goodly and kindly woman. Oh, let's go on. Now, Laban and Bethuel replied again to the servant. Remember, they're at the meal, and the servant has just recounted the story of how, how he came into contact with Rebekah. And they said, the matter comes from the Lord. So, do you hear what they're saying? They're saying, we trust this. This must be of God. They, too, are trusting God. Although, here, you just have to wait to see some of the shenanigans later on. But we cannot speak to you, good or bad. So here's Rebecca before you. Take her, go. Let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. Well, that's a big step. You're going to trust your daughter, your sister, to go to a foreign land? To marry a kinswoman? A kinsman, pardon me, who you've never met? Laban and Bethuel, do not, for now, get in the way of the Lord's guidance. Let's go on. When Abraham's servant heard the words, he bowed himself to the ground before the Lord. The servant brought out articles of silver and gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah and also precious things to her brother and her mother. And then he and the men who were with them and ate and drank and spent the night. And when they rose in the morning, said, send me away to my master. But her brother and her mother said, Let the girl stay with us a few days. Say ten. Afterwards she may go with you. Servant, he, he's not taking no for an answer. He says, Do not delay me since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away <coughs> that I may go to my master. He wants to go now and not wait for ten days. So here's something amazing. Listen to her. Listen to this. So they said, we will call the girl. We'll consult her wishes. See, we get this impression in the Bible that uh, women were just cattle. And you know, in a lot of cases, they were. But that's not God's will. God did not make the woman lower than the man. God made them equal partners. And this is one of the things that this story is attempting to illustrate. That her opinion is a valued thing. If she wants to say no, she has every right to say no, because this is her life. And she will do as she see fits, according to her relationship with God. Do not lose this amidst the story. She's not a piece of cattle to be bartered and sold. She has an opinion and she's given permission to use her brain and make a decision herself. I love this about the story. This is returning and restoring God's initial attention in creation where man and woman were created equal partners. So they called Rebecca and they said to her, we go with this man. She knew what was going to happen. She said, I'll go. Thus they sent her away. Thus they sent away their sister Rebekah and her nurse with Abraham's servants and his men, and they blessed Rebekah and said, 
May you, our sister, become thousands of ten thousands. May your descendants possess the gate of those who hate them. And Rebekah rose with her maids, and they mounted camels and followed the man. So the servant took Rebekah and departed. I love how, again, Rebekah is asked whether or not she's willing to go. The amazing thing, once again, about Rebekah is she is faithful to God. She trusts that God will provide for her. So she, too, expresses that spirit of gratitude and faithfulness. Finally, we get to the point where Mar Isaac marries Rebecca. Now, Isaac, <coughs> excuse me, had come from going to Beer Lehiroi, for he was living in the Negev. Isaac went out to mediate in the field toward evening. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, the camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the candles. It was like love at first sight. When she lifted her eyes, the first thing that they were attracted to, the first thing they saw was each other. That's what is implied here. They look, he looked up and, you know, oh yeah, there were camels. But amidst all the camels, against all the crowd, he saw her. And amidst all the things and all the chaos and all the people that he was mediating, and he was mediating, he was with all these people. He was kind of a judge, I guess you would say. People were coming to him, and uh, the disputes that were being mediated, she looked up, and she had eyes only for him. They were just drawn to each other. They were still at a distance. Incredible. goes on. She said, Rebecca said to her servant, Who's that man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, He's my master. Oh, look what she does. So she took her veil, and she covered herself. Why? Because she'd already made the decision. I'm going to marry this man. <laughs> you know, it reminds me, when I, uh, when I first met my wife, it was an interesting story. I, I um, was at college, Houghton College in upstate New York, and uh, I was trying out for a singing team called Youth in One Accord. She was one of the people on Youth in One Accord, and she, along with the other youth in Youth in One Accord, were supposed to make a judgment of whether or not I was going to be permissible are acceptable on the singing team. So I come in there, she walks in, and she's on crutches because she had, I guess, broken her uh, leg when she went home uh, for, for Christmas break that year. And she comes walking in her crutches. I looked up, I saw her, and bam! This crazy thought struck my mind. That's the girl I'm gonna marry. It's never happened to me before. And so she sat down and she started talking to me. She was the one in charge of grilling me or interviewing me. As soon as she opened her mouth, I said, good. God, where did that thought come from? Because she gave me such a hard time about being a Lutheran, about being this and about being that. Aren't you Lutheran pastors all drunkards? Don't you guys go and do this? She was just relentless. And I said, God, I don't know where that thought came from. It's amazing, though. It must have been planned there by God, because if I had not had that thought, I probably would have given up right then and there. But God planted that thought in my heart. And here I am, 30 plus years later, still married to that beautiful woman who for the very first time when I saw her knew that God had provided for our future. This is what happens. She knows that God had provided for her future and for Isaac's future, that this was the person that God had placed upon her heart to marry. So she covered herself. So her husband told Isaac all the things that he had done. And Isaac brought her into her mother's womb. He just, he just said, okay. This is God's provision. So, sight unseen, they haven't even seen each other. He hasn't lifted the veil yet. He doesn't know what she looks like, so it's not physical. But listen to what happens. He brought her to his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebecca. She became his wife. Oh, here's the most important thing. He loved her. This is not a reference to physical activity. This is something you don't see elsewhere in the Bible. This man fell hard for her. He was deeply, madly in love with her. And the Bible continues this theme throughout the chapters that are to come. Isaac was then comforted after his mother's death by the presence of Rebekah, it says. This is love at first type. Rebekah and he were attracted to each other 
and knew that they were right for each other. They were married right away. This provided comfort to Isaac. And again, I would point out the great love that they had for her. Again, not something usually that's added. In fact, if you notice a lot of the stories of marriage in the Bible, it never mentions that they love each other. They just kind of, they're together. It's, it's almost like a, it's an exchange of services. Well, we fit. We got to do this. I need somebody. You need somebody. Here we are. It's a convenience thing. But not in this case. They love each other. This is God's will for us. So oftentimes throughout the centuries, and you know, if you take a look at the medieval days, people just married each other because they needed to. It wasn't a love. This is kind of a newfangled concept, at least it seems like. But that was also God's intention. That people fall in love with each other. Support one another. Find passion in one another. Care for one another. God is, through Rebecca and Isaac, showing us how wonderful life can be when we find the partner fit for us that God has provided. This story gets even more intense as it goes on. We're not going to read any more today. That's for another day. Again, this is unusual for the Bible to mention these types of details, to invest so much time in just what seems like a love story. But it is a reminder of God's intention of creation. When God created us both male and female, we are created for each other, to love one another, to care for one another, to be partners for one another. Rebecca and Isaac are fulfilling God's plan of man and woman, of leaving and cleaving to one another. In this love, God is saying there is hope for a universe without violence. I want you to hear this because I think this is the point of this love story. And the love of Isaac and Rebekah, God is planting a seed of hope for this world. That in the love that we find in one another, there is an ending to violence. Now we're going to see in this story in the months, uh, weeks to come, unfortunately other people are going to start putting a lot of pressure on this relationship. They're going to start grinding away at this relationship, including Rebecca's sister, and it's, it's going to be chaos. But the relationship is still going to abide, reminding us that the greatest of all things is the gift of love that God has for us and that sustains us despite the weariness and the travail and the hardships that others throw upon us. You know, and in just a little bit while, this may, may or may not be a shock, I'm recording this earlier today on Tuesday. It will be available tonight at 7.30. But in the between times, between now and then, I will be performing a wedding at 5.30 p.m. for a couple that wants to come to the altar and be married. It can be a simple little thing, just them and a handful of other people. That's it. But they want to acknowledge God's presence in their relationship. It's a beautiful thing. I thank God for that. It's, but when they gather together at the altar, one of the things I'm going to do is read the charge of marriage that talks about how God's intention is for us to be united as one, to fall in love with each other, to support one another. But... Sin creates a burden upon this relationship that often divides our relationships. That's part of the charge. But through Jesus Christ, we can have our joy restored. I'm going to leave you with this tonight. Maybe these last months have put a lot of pressure on your relationship with your spouse or the people that you love. It is in Jesus Christ that God promises to restore joy so I'm praying for you, that God would restore your joy, that you would see hopefulness in this love story between Rebecca and Isaac, a promise, a reminder of who you are. You are made in God's image. You are made for one another. God has made us to love one another. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Rebecca and Isaac, the reminder of that great love story that you started Back all the way at the time of creation with, Abraham, or with Adam and Eve, you made them for one another to fall in love, to 
deeply, passionately care for one another, to sustain one another. God, the weariness of this world can truly crash in upon these things. But Rebecca and Isaac are a reminder that you've not given up on love. We should not either. So I pray that you'd restore our joy. For he asks this in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May God restore your love and your joy for one another. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen.